Uh, well, good afternoon, and um, also welcome um, from me uh, to you uh, to the session uh, on education uh, in uh, respect to the successful or challenges for successful non-viral delivery of nucleic acids and proteins in vivo. Um, and uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our first speaker uh, of the afternoon, uh, Ewan Ramsey, um, who is uh, visiting us from Precision Nanosystems um, in Vancouver, uh, Canada. Um, and Ewan will lead off our session with a overview that will highlight some of the um, barriers and approaches for uh, sort of uh, getting around these barriers uh, related to production uh, of, of nanoparticles uh, through rapid methods uh, related to gene and cell therapies. Okay. Thanks, everyone. So, I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to come and uh, speak to you today on challenges related to the production of, of nanoparticles. So as Millie mentioned, uh, I'm from Precision Nanosystems. I'm one of the co-founders of the company, so I'll be looking at this very much through the lens of microfluidics, which is the, the focus of Precision Nanosystems. Okay, there we go. So. What I'd like to, to do today is just introduce you to some concepts that we think of when we're developing nano, nanomedicines, particularly around the, the manufacturing aspects. I think as we all appreciate here in this room that nanoparticles are very complex systems. We're looking at encouraging hundreds of thousands of molecules to self-assemble into a defined structure. And so very much the adage that the product is the process holds true for, for, for nanoparticles. So I think it's very important that we identify manufacturing processes uh, that are very controllable and allow us to develop and define uh, nanoparticle products. And we'll emphasize this or illustrate this concept by showing some biological data where the performance of the particles is dictated by the manufacturing process. And we'll speculate on what aspects of the nanoparticle biophysical characteristics imparted by the manufacturing process influences this biological behavior. And when we have a, a, a process that's rapid and, and easy to use, and we apply design of experiment approaches we can start to tackle the, the challenges of nanoparticle uh, drug development. I'm sure you'll be aware that there's significant amount of variables that can be manipulated in order to design these systems. So a mechanism for us to rapidly do so uh, would have a, a great advantage. And we'll give some illustrations of, of applying this in, in some cell therapy and gene therapy applications. And then finally, um, when we um, think on, we think about the challenges of manufacturing these systems, scale up has always been a big impediment for the rapid or for the adoption of these types of systems as a therapeutic modality. And so again, we'll give an insight into how we overcome this by essentially scaling out as a, a mechanism to, to scale up. And I'll give you some more details on what exactly I mean by that. So, okay, so the, the nanoparticle product is dependent on the manufacturing process. Here, the liposomes are probably the most mature of the, the nanoparticles that are currently available clinically, and as such, they've uh, been rewarded, if you like, with some FDA uh, guidance, and I think emphasized here around this concept of the product is the process is these statements in this document, such as the one highlighted here, indicating that these drug products are sensitive to changes in the manufacturing conditions, not least uh, when we increase the scale of, of production. So when we think about, again, this concept of making these particles, this self-assembly process, is illustrated here in this cartoon a representation of the formation of a nucleic acid lipid nanoparticle, we need to have an optimal 
conditions to support the self-assembly process and control the self-assembly process so that the molecules orientate and interact in the manner that we are seeking in order to determine the characteristics of the particle. And so when we think about this, and, and as Millie indicated, Precision Nanosystems is out of Vancouver, and this company has really come about with the output of a very selfish uh, focus on solving our own internal problems of reproducibly manufacturing these nanoparticles and finding a mechanism by which we could scale them up. So even though we come from a, a, the lab of uh, Professor Peter Cullis, which is well-renowned in this space, we still had challenges manufacturing these types of products, transferring them within the lab, transferring to other labs and, and scaling, scaling up. And so this is why we were uh, first uh, interested, like others, in the, the concept of using microfluidics in this manufacturing process. And what microfluidics allows us to do, or what we can take advantage of, is the physics of fluid flow when we're fl flowing fluids through these very small micro channels. And this is illustrated in this, this figure here. So on the, on the left-hand side, we have a, a microfluidic device where we're introducing dyes of various colors into that microfluidic device. You can see that they're flowing under laminar flow conditions. They're flowing side by side. So if we look towards the outlet of that device, if we were to look at a cross-section of that outlet at any moment in time, we would see the same conditions. So we have this concept of time invariant mixing. So meaning that all the molecules have the same experience as they go through this, go through this system. Okay? Now if we contrast that when we flow the same types of fluids through a much larger diameter channel where we have turbulent mixing, you can see in that illustration on the right hand side that if we were to look at a cross-sectional area of, of that mixing chamber, the conditions would be, would be different based on what area we looked at and also based on the time uh, that we, that we took, a, took an image. So really what we're, we're saying here is that with this laminar flow, we can control the mixing of fluids which contain the nanoparticle components, so thereby we can uh, control the self-assembly process. And so what, we've, what we do with that is we then develop our, our microfluidic mixers. And so this cartoon representation shows you very simply what we're, what we're doing here. So typically we have solvent, which contains nanoparticle components, such as lipids, for example. We have an aqueous phase, include a, a nucleic acid. They enter our microfluidic uh, mixer in, under laminar flow conditions. And really what we're using is we're using additional mixer technology to essentially increase the surface area of interaction. So essentially when the two, the two fluids enter the microfluidic mixer, it's the interface between the solvent phase and the aqueous phase where we have a nanoprecipitation reaction which seeds this self-assembly process. And by introducing mixing structures, we can increase that a fluid interface and thereby we can have very controlled and rapid mixing technology. So here's a couple of examples of the types of mixers that, that we and others have, have used. The most well-known uh, device is the staggered herringbone mixer. This mixer has features that hang down from the, the channels. These features are essentially designed to fold the fluid streams over on top of each other. What this does is it increases that interface of reaction while concomitantly reducing the diffusional distance the molecules have to move to interact. So a very controlled mixing in environment. So we've taken this technology that's been typically used in microfluidics in the analytical environment with low flow rates, for example, and low volumes, and optimize the architecture so that we can operate at much higher flow rates, in this instance, for at 12 mils per minute, 
so that this technology has the capacity to be commercially viable and, and scalable. Now, one of the challenges with making this staggered herringbone mixer is that it's very difficult to fabricate. And so if we want to make this system in a material that's compatible with manufacturing a drug product, we have to uh, make this using uh, plastic, for example, like cyclic olefin polymer. We use injection molding uh, to etch the, the, the features, essentially, and then we bond a laminate on, on top of that. It's a very difficult and very technical, challenging process. So more recently, what we have done is we've moved over to this Dean Vortex bifurcating mixer. In this instance, we're using the same principles of increasing the surface area of the interface, but in this case, what we're doing is diverting fluid streams and recombining them using these series of, of toroids. Now, what's interesting about this technology is we have a more dynamic range where we can still control mixing through the laminar flow, and consequently, we can actually operate up to 75 mils per minute through a single device, so much quicker, much more amenable to scalability. But I think what's uh, maybe of more our interest is these mixers are planar, and therefore they're much easier to manufacture. And so now we can look at manufacturing these microfluidic devices in a range of materials, such as stainless steel, peak, Teflon, glass. And so that gives us a broader range of, of, of solvent compatibilities, for example. And so it gives us a greater base of um, technology that we can work with to develop our, our mixing systems. And so essentially what we've done as a, a company here is we've taken this microfluidic mixing technology, we've placed it in instruments that are designed to mimic the drug discovery and development process and the instruments essentially control the rate by which the fluids flow through the, the microfluidic devices. And those rates of fluid flow, for example, are pr process parameters that can be used to design particles of specific characteristics. So you can see here we have systems that go from microliters for discovery right up to tens of liters for scale-up manufacturing in GMP environment. So let's show you some some data and as I alluded to in the introduction, I think one of the interesting facets of developing this type of technology is really understanding that the manufacturing process does influence the product and maybe not surprisingly that influences its biological behaviour. So this is data generated by a client of ours. They were particularly interested in comparing they are in, in uh, their current technology, which is this, as they describe it, second generation mixing this T-tube or inline mixing technology with the, the microfluidic mixing technology. And so what they were interested in doing was manufacturing, in this case, some siRNA lipid nanoparticles and testing them in a, a typical factor seven model. So, so here's the, 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 the data here. Okay, so factor seven, for those of you who are not familiar, is almost exclusively synthesized in hepatocytes in the liver. So it's a very good in vivo model for us to measure the effectiveness of gene, gene knockdown. And so essentially they've taken the same ingredients, the same lipids, the same siRNA, they've made it using a T-tube, they've made it using the microfluidics technology, and you can see in this dose effect, curve or does affect bar chart that simply by changing the process in their hands with their systems from the T-tube to the microfluidic mixing had a significant impact in the biological behavior. So if we look at the highest dose there, it's almost a five-fold increase in, in the knockdown of factor seven when you compare the microfluidics to the T-tube. To the so the question is, and this is pretty unexpected is why is this the case? So if we look at some basic size data here where we're looking at this dynamic light scattering, so the microfluidics particles are in the, the orange, uh, the 
the T tube particles are in the, the grey. You can see that the microfluidics particles have a, a much better defined particle size than a, a narrow PDI. So perhaps the difference in biological behaviour is because with the microfluidics technology that more of the particles actually get to the, the side of action. Perhaps with some of the larger particles implied by this large polydispersity index with T-tube, after systemic injection, they're getting caught up in their lung bed and are not available for, you know, for um, activity. They also did some cryo uh, transmission electron microscopy. And again, what's interesting here is we can see that the structures that of the, these siRNA lipid nanoparticles dictated by the manufacturing process differ. So when they use their systems with this T-tube, you've got this multi-lamella um, morphology, whereas if you use the microfluidics device, you have this solid core morphology. Now this is, these are pretty recent observations where we've looked much more closely at cryo-TEM and really understanding these tertiary, if we like, structures of these systems. I think there's more and more work in the literature trying to understand the significance of those structures and how they relate to, to biological behavior. And I think this is something we'll see a lot more of uh, in the future. So the Cullis Lab that we work with is published on this. There's been publications that have come out of the work that Merck did with siRNA. And then more recently, the, the AstraZeneca group in Mondal are working with Moderna have published on mRNA lipid nanoparticles as well. So I think there's some real intriguing indications that those structures, particularly when we're talking about mRNA, may influence their, their biological behavior. So if we have a, a, a system and a process where we can make these, these particles in a, a reproducible, reproducible manner, how can we actually apply this uh, in a mechanism that accelerates development of these types of, of systems? So if we can take the, the, the rapid production and we can align that with design of experiment approaches, we can start to screen numerous variables and really understand what are the important characteristics of these particles that are required for activity in our given uh, target system. So I just want to give you an example of how we do this in, in our own uh, labs when we think about cell therapy or we think about delivering nucleic acids to um, cells such as IPS-derived cells or, or primary cells such as, as T cells. So we're exploiting obviously our own technology here. We're using our, our screening system and it's a simple workflow as we've illustrated here where essentially we have three wells. One well we pipette a collection buffer. One well we pipette our nucleic acid in an aqueous buffer. And the final well we pipette, um, we pipette, pipette the lipids in nucleic acids. Uh, sorry, the lipids in the, the, the solvent, apologies. And then simply uh, put a cap on the, on the cartridge there, put that into the instrument. An instrument's designed to force air through the filter on the lid of the cartridge, which forces the fluids out of the wells, mix in the microfluidic mixing chamber, and then they're collected in the, the dilution buffer and are ready to apply to cells. So if we use this in a, in a screening mode, we typically have panels, we can look at variables which are important for the activity of these systems, such as particle size, zeta potential, surface charge, the components, the relative ratios of each of these components, the NTP ratio, for, for example, and look at activity. And we can basically do a screen, look at the results, use those results to feed back and continue to um, iterate and optimize the, the systems using this screen. So we've used um, in our interest here in the differentiation from iPSCs to cortical neurons, human iPS-derived cortical neurons, to test this method and see if we can identify 
lipid nanoparticle formulations that are effective in delivery of plasmid DNA in this instance. Okay, so each of these cells represents a different stage, obviously, in the differentiation. So they have different biological characteristics. Consequently, they have different challenges we have to overcome in order to get effective delivery here. So we've worked internally, we've worked with also validated this technology with some collaborators. This data was generated by the stem cell core at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And in this instance, we've got to the, uh, this round of screening. We can show GFP expression in approximately, I think, 60% of those, um, of those iPSC cells. So going from very low level through this iterative process, we can get up to levels which have, uh, are, are viable for, you know, for research and, and development. Then when we look at the neuroprogenitor cells, and because of the, the, the time these cells are in culture through the differentiation pathway, we can start to look at the expression of GFP over a, over a long term. So we can work on the systems and look to optimize these systems for different characteristics uh, depending on the requirements that we're looking to um, implement in these, in these systems. And then similarly, we can then take it to the iPSC-derived neurons, again, look at, look at these types of plays. So using this iterative process, we've been successfully able to at least deliver GFP to these different cell types. And what I would say is that these different cell types don't necessarily re re require the same LMP formulation. I'd also say as well that these um, achievements here have been done without changing the cationic lipid. So a lot of times it's about simply iterating on the cationic lipid to improve performance. That's not necessarily the only method by which you can do so. So we can do this with mRNA and we can look at using this process in different cells. So looking at these primary human CD8 T cells, for example, we've got different formulations, one to 10. We're looking here on the, on the left-hand side, the percentage of the treated cell population that are GFP positive. And then we're looking at within that percentage of the cell population that are positive for GFP, what's the intensity of the GFP expression? So if we look at, for example, um, the percentage of GFP cells positive. Obviously, formulation number one is, is very high, both for low, sorry, the low means low NTP ratio, means NTP of four, high is NTP of six. We can see that if we actually then look at the amount of GFP expressed, then the high NTP ratio in formulation one has, is, is obviously better. So if that's your desired characteristic, that may be a starting point for further optimization. However, maybe formulation three is better where you're looking for high percentage of the cells expressing your protein, but you want to moderate the level of expression. This, for example, this may be desirable for looking at mRNA expression of, of Cas9 to a, a level that allows the genome editing while minimizing off-target effects. So this gives you a, an ability to, to screen and optimize depending on your, on your, your needs. This is just an, an example here from one of our collaborators, Kyle Fink. And what Kyle is interested in doing is delivering this tail, which is against a SNP mutant, T3 gamma, into Huntington disease mice. And I think from a drug delivery perspective, really interested in that the formulation F2 seems to um, be well expressed in cortical neurons, whereas F18 is is less so, and the converse is true for the striatal, the striatal neurons. So again, I think there's this concept where we can start to manipulate and design our systems where we can achieve um, tissue-specific activities. So this is really interesting data. So I've only given you a snapshot of that data. My colleagues will be presenting a poster uh, tomorrow evening. Suggest you go, if you're interested, go and speak to them. Uh, the people that actually do the work is probably a more impactful conversation, so they'll be able to talk you through lots more data. 
So if we, if we achieve that goal of identifying a system, a nanoparticle system through this rapid process in a research level, in a preclinical development level, how can we scale this up? That's always been a challenge for nanoparticles. When with microfluidics, we're scaling up by scaling out. So what we're doing is we're arraying the microfluidic mixers in parallel. So if we have one mixer that operates at 12 mils per minute, if we have eight mixers in parallel, we're now operating close to 100 mils per minute, but neither the process nor the reaction chambers, reaction conditions have, have changed. So this concept of scaling out, uh, scaling up by scaling out, mitigates the inherent risks traditionally with these types of systems. And so to, to demonstrate that, we've used a mRNA lipid nanoparticle formulation. This is a, a model system encapsulating luciferase messenger RNA. We're using a, a lipid nanoparticle composition which is very similar to that used by Elnylam in our Patisiran product. And we're using standard manufacturing conditions in microfluidics um, in order for, to make these, these particles. The particles come off the microfluidic device in approximately 25% ethanol. So there are dilution steps to stabilize the particle and subsequent processing steps to exchange the buffer and concentrate the, the system here. So if we use our, our three uh, systems, three nano assembler systems uh, to manufacture these, these particles, the bench top, which is a single microfluidic device, we make seven mils. If we make 70 mils on the blaze, which is our preclinical scale-up system, which uses continuous flow manufacturing. And then we use uh, the ADEX system. So this is our scale-up system designed for GMP, where we have eight devices arrayed in parallel. You can see, as we look at the, the systems after they've been, been diluted, that the size and the PDI are comparable. So the sizes of the bar charts, the PDI is the, the dots. Similarly, if we then process through uh, tangential flow filtration, for example, again, we can see that because we're using the same process, the same microfluidic mixing reactors, we're essentially getting the same product. And the same can be seen when we um, look at the, uh, the cryo TEM. So these particles are consistent. So it's kind of demonstrating this concept of scaling up by scaling, scaling out. Again, I've only given you a few elements of, of this particular um, proof of concept study. Friday, there's a poster with much more um, data there if you're, if you're interested. So again, I hope what I'm showing you here is that by using, employing microfluidics, we can improve the particle quality by building instrumentation around it. It makes the process much simpler and controlled because the system is controlled by microfluidics and automated instruments. It's the batch-to-batch -batch reproducibility is improved. You can improve production yields because the particles are better defined. The, the system is set up for these faster development processes. Scaling out allows us to, to scale up and in some instances, you can improve the activity of your, of your systems. It remains me to acknowledge the R&D team, the engineering and science team at uh, Precision Nanosystems and our collaborators, Kyle at UC Davis and the folks at Cedar sinai for their tip. And then finally, our shameless plug for Precision here. We have a symposium 2018 in New York City in the summer. Uh, we'll be presenting on others to present on clinical successes as well as hosting some uh, workshops if you're interested in that. So thanks everyone for your attention. Yeah, so the, we operate at a regime where we have an aqueous to, to repeat the question, sorry, yeah. The question was, um, the particles are coming out 
in 25% ethanol. So they come off the microfluidic device in 25% ethanol. How do we process them? Um, how do we remove the, the ethanol? And so, the, as I said, the, we operate a regime where it's a three to one aqueous to ethanol flow rate ratio. So the, the particles do indeed come out in 25% ethanol. We immediately dilute the particles below a critical ethanol concentration. That's typically less than 10%. And when they're at that level, they're relatively, relatively stable um, under storage for, for some time. That depends on the, the formulation. But subsequent processing, typically what we would use, particularly at large scale, is uh, tangential flow filtration or diafiltration. Um, so that's how we use, remove the ethanol. Uh, we exchange the buffer. The buffer is typically acidic as it comes off the microfluidic device. So we also exchange the buffer um, to a physio neutral physiological pH. And we can concentrate as, as well. So TFS is typically the system that we use. Yep, so the, the, the systems that we have, so the microfluidic devices we have, uh, the majority of them are in cyclic olefin polymer. That's a Teflon-like material. It's fairly inert. Um, so we, we also have devices in stainless steel, um, peak Teflon, so different, different materials. We haven't seen an influence of the materials on the, the structure, at least in our hands, of the of the particles, but it certainly has uh, an impact on the, interac the potential interaction of the materials with the, with the device. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.